When your child is struggling with sensory issues like daily meltdowns, refusing to wear certain clothes or eating certain foods, they're having issues sleeping, they're struggling with transitions. When you are dealing with that, parents, it is exhausting, right? It's exhausting and, and frustrating because you want them to fall in line. You want them to behave like you would expect them to, but also it rips your heart out because you know that they're not necessarily choosing to. You can just tell that they're struggling inside. It's not just a behavior issue. It's not just a discipline thing. They can't regulate and they can't calm down like you would expect them or hope them to. And listen, there is a whole other conversation we could have around boys will be boys and the terrible twos and, and what the role of parenting is. And that is a piece of it, right? We need to make sure that we have appropriate expectations for our kids. But what we see more and more is kids struggling, not just because we need to tweak up the parenting style or because that that's them being a toddler, but they're struggling because they're dealing with way more sensory issues internally than uh, we realize, which is making everything else that we're asking them to do overwhelming and challenging. So parents, this video is for you. If you want to better understand sensory issues, if you want to have a, a route to getting to the actual why or the root cause at play, instead of just trying to um, negotiate your way through it, this is for you. And I want to help you understand what is really going on. This is becoming an incredibly common issue. Current estimates are somewhere around one in six kids are dealing with some sort of sensory issue. And these are some of our favorite stories at Thrive. Even though it is so common and it affects your life so much, I can think of several kids off the top of my head in just the last few weeks or months that we've seen amazing life changes, right? We get pictures from parents of them doing different things that they would have never done in the past, whether it's being able to try on new shoes and pick out shoes without it being a whole, whole new ordeal, playing in water, playing in the hose, and their clothes getting wet, and instead of immediately needing to rip that off, just chugging along and having a great time, or able to tolerate different positions and transitions. So many stories I could go into of kids that are doing amazing with this, um, but it is something that is really common for families. And so if you feel like you're dealing with this, you're not alone in that struggle at all. Uh, first thing I want you to understand with what's going on here is this connects to a lot of other challenges neurodevelopmentally for kids. We actually see it linked with a lot of ADHD or focus, school age concerns, even stuff like autism spectrum, that emotional regulation or communication struggles. Honestly, I don't really love any of the labels, the diagnoses, the names that we give kids, but this sensory processing label, that word is one that describes what's at the root of all of them. It's really the foundation of any other neurodevelopmental issue. So there is a lot of overlap and a lot of, a lot of um, connections between those. What's really going on with the sensory processing is that there is an overwhelmed and an off-track sensory system internally. So a sensory input is all of the messages coming up to the brain. It's all the afferent info. So it's when we have different sensations from touch, from sight, from smells, uh, anything that's coming up into the brain should be giving it a certain perception. What happens when a kid is struggling with SPD or sensory processing disorder is that instead of a, a normal input, a normal brain nutrition or brain food, you could think of it as, that sensory input that should be coming in is perceived as noise. That kind of gets jumbled up. And um, we'll talk about why that is. But that jumbled up sensory input, instead of being just good brain input and brain nutrition, that now is being interpreted as noise, as stress, as an SOS signal. And that is where things start to go south because a noisy, brain, a stressed out, uh, SOS signal filled brain is one that cannot regulate. It cannot focus and can't do a lot of stuff. Actually, depending on the age, this is going to disrupt so many different aspects of development. And I say depending on the age, because at younger ages, right, when kids are a baby, when we don't really even think of sensory issues in the name sense that we're, we're talking about here, it's still affecting them. The same thing is taking place, but it shows up as gut and GI stuff. It shows up as tension and stiffness and arching, they're wrenching, they're never relaxed, they're never calm. Uh, but then as we get older, it does present itself different ways, right? Once we start to expect kids to be able to regulate emotions a little differently, to communicate a little differently, that's when the neuro aspect of this same underlying concept starts showing up. So this noisy, confused, dysregulated brain is what the sensory input disturbance is leading to. And now, a couple main sensory perceptions here. One would be the motor system, right? Our motor system is every time we're moving. That's why movement is so huge for kids, whether it's just a baby being on their belly, figuring out the world, looking, their head, looking around and lifting their head up, um, or it's our kids running outside and playing and jumping and being crazy and being a little bit dangerous. Uh, it's okay, risky play is a good thing for them. 
all of that input is feeding the brain. That's a ton of sensory input, a ton of sensory stimulation. So we need that. So the sensory input, that motor input, is one that gets disturbed when we have these jumbled up signals, when we have these disturbances. The other main sensory input is more of our gut and our GI and our internal sensory system, which is through the vagus nerve. Those two things, the motor and the vagus nerve input, those are the biggest calming parts of our nervous system. Those are the ones that when they're being properly stimulating, properly fed, that's what regulates everything. That's why it's so helpful when kids get out and move and play, when they don't have this dysregulated piece of sensory issues. Movement helps simmer down all of that noise and all of that stress because it's giving the brain good food, good nutrition. So when we have those main sensory inputs of the vagus nerve, of our motor input being disturbed, now all of a sudden their jobs of that calming GI immune regulation roles, all of those calming influences are getting out of control. Instead of being, um, instead of doing their job of pumping the brakes and lowering that stress level and allowing kids to hone in and focus, it is like mayday on the scene. And that's really what's going on. It's kids that are struggling with these transitions or sensory issues, a lot of times parents will describe it as they feel like they have to walk on eggshells around the house. And that's because their kid's already teetering on the brink, right? They're already at a nine out of 10 when they're just at baseline, right? Their default mode is so ramped up that it doesn't take a whole lot extra. It doesn't take a whole lot of being told no or a transition or a change in the schedule or even just like a, a negative extra sensory input, right? That's where the textures and the clothing and all those other things come in, the noises. It doesn't take more, a whole, or more, it doesn't take as much as you would expect to set them off because they are so sensitized and triggered already. So that's where, well, one more piece on that before we get into some of the solution. Cause I know part of what you're wondering is like, well, why does this get jumbled, right? Why does a kid deal with some of those disturbances or why might they have, more of that uh, SOS signal instead of calming good input. Honestly, we see a lot of that start early on in life, whether it's pregnancy in utero positioning, it, positioning if baby gets really twisted up or torqued up in the womb, uh, that a lot of times will mess up some of those upper regular, regulatory centers or some of the mid to upper thoracic spine, depending on how they're jammed and contorsioned in there. Uh, so pregnancy can be a big one. The birth process itself is immensely traumatic. Uh, even if everything goes really well, it's a big deal for that kid, right? But especially when we see, you know, 30, 40, 50% of births are C-sections at this point, then there's forceps and vacuum extraction that's on top of that, let alone just manual extraction, right? Doctors or midwives hands pulling, guiding at that gentle head and neck. All of those things are going to disturb a lot of our neurospinal pathways that then are taking this good sensory input and turning it into stress. So that's the, that's the most common ones, but there's a million of them, guys, right? If you just watch America's Funniest Home Videos of Kids, you'll see them landing on their head, falling off the slide. You'll see them rolling down the stairs. And you've seen it in your own life, in your own kids. If you've got kids more than a day old, uh, they've been through stuff. And those traumas and physical inputs are usually what sets the stage for this disconnected sensory system. Uh, last couple things I wanna mention here, guys. OT is usually the first line of defense for sensory challenges, and we love OT. Right? There's so many good OT therapists, a lot of our patients work with a lot of them, and that is on the right track. But usually what we see parents report is that there's improvement with OT, but then they kind of get stuck and they are dealing with a lot of challenges still because it's not able to actually address that disturbance. It's trying to calm and regulate that sensory input and give you different tools or ways to, um, to pump the brakes, but it's not actually addressing that internal ramped up system, right? It's not actually taking the kid from a nine out of 10 and lowering it. It's just giving you more tools to calm and stimulate or self-soothe. So that's really where our role comes in is if we want to actually address that underlying disturbance, right? We want to pump the brakes, so to speak, get the kid out of that fight or flight state so that all of this extra stimulation, whether it's the noise or the textures or you name it, it's not pushing them over the edge, right? They can handle it and adapt to it better. That's where we love having scans to base that off of because our care plans aren't gonna be just based on symptoms or based on what we guess is gonna be the issue. We've actually got several different neurological scans that are measuring and quantifying and actually tracking what's going on for that kid. So the scans dictate the plans. We don't guess, we test. And I got way more jokes than that. Uh, it is true though, we'll use that quantifiable objective information to map out what does that game plan need to look like for the kid? And how much of these challenges are they dealing with, right? Is this a 10 out of 10 severity? Or yeah, we've got some stuff going on, but maybe there's more to the story. Uh, and uh, coming back to what we mentioned earlier, you know, kids will be kids or terrible twos. 
I love the scans because it helps us answer that question, right? Is this a kid who just, yeah, they're, um, they're going to be a kid. They're going to have their own version of an attitude and a little bit of a, a fight in them. Um, or is it a kid who is dealing with a lot of internal stress and internal anxiety in fight or fight mode too? So it lets us answer that. We don't have to just um, rely on, you know, wait and see and then just kind of taking that approach to it. So listen, if this makes sense to you guys, if this is really your kid and you're just and it sounds like too many of those uh, examples are what your day-to-day -day life is like, let's see what their scans look like, right? Let's get that kid checked out. Maybe you've even been down that OT route and you've seen some cool changes. Let's make sure that they are at their best. Let's make sure that they're reaching their full potential. Send us a message here, reach out, call the team if you got more questions on that. You wanna know what that process looks like. We're here to help and we wanna do whatever we can to make sure your kid is reaching their full potential.